What's up and welcome to Idol Insights, a show where each week I, Trevor Bettis, talk to interesting people about Dungeons and & Dragons and Idol Champions. And this week is with me is the amazing Mark Mir. I'm delighted to be here, especially because I, I suppose that means I'm an interesting person. You are an interesting... You, Mark, you are such an interesting person. You kidding oh, me? Oh, I'm glad to hear. <laughs> what, I mean, for one... One you, but also look at look at your background. I mean, come on. I got I, this. Is not a virtual background. It's a real background. I've <laughs> this, got all is, this crazy. This is stuff. a virtual background. I don't live in a cartoon world. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, I mean, I know we're here for a purpose, but still, it's, uh, I, I thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to talk with us. Um, but yeah, so I, well, okay, before we get into why, I'm going to do the yes. usual thing I do on these shows when I'm talking to someone for the first time, because it's my favorite little icebreaker for nerds, which is, how did you get into D&D? Uh, well, uh, you have to go all the way back to the early 1980s. And in fact, uh, to the point where Fiend Folio was the exciting Ooh. new release that had just come out. And uh, I was I was uh, younger than the people I started playing with. They, the, I was playing with kids that were a few years older. So they introduced me through uh, AD&D, Advanced Ooh. Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and subsequently, my parents bought me the red and blue box, of course. And so I had those. I had, you know, Keep on the Borderlands and Isle of Dread, those, those initial modules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, it felt like going back to training wheels because the result, you know, it's like, what do you mean? Like elf and dwarf are your class. That's the, you know, that's not right. Uh, so I, I very quickly went back to AD&D, got the books for that. Uh, and uh, I did actually adapt those those early modules that was some of my first dm type work was oh yeah was actually taking those basic and expert modules and transferring them over to advanced dungeons and dragons so so i mean we're gonna be talking a lot about you dming was that was that like your first time dming a game was with those modules uh again this was like long before i actually became a dm because mm -hmm. while i could play if you know i i played with those older kids and the thing is you know, uh, they sort of drifted away from the hobby, perhaps. Uh, and I was then left with uh, the only one option, which was teach other people how to play Dungeons and Dragons and mm -hmm. be the dungeon master if I wanted to play. <laughs> uh, and so I became a forever DM for a few years. It wasn't a forever DM. It was a few years uh, until one of my other players started running. Uh, but that was that was basically how I got into being a DM. The, the 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 few years DM I like that one, <laughs> um, but yeah we're it felt like forever it felt like forever. <laughs> it does I it's... just want, I just want to play again yeah. no I I remember the the like oh man it had to have been like a good four or five year stint where I was the DM for all the games that my groups ran mm -hmm. and and eventually I did start to the point where I'm just like okay like I I not all, not only am, am I am I running out creatively but it's like this is a lot of games to be DMing and so I just be like. Hey, uh, friend, uh, have, you, have you ever thought about the interesting life of being a DM? <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, a few of them took me up on that. Um, yes. Yeah. And and I think for a while there, it was like a, a co-DM situation, uh, which you would you sometimes run into where mm -hmm. we each had a player character in the party, but they'd just become an NPC or or leave when we were DMing. Yep. They, they went off to do something else. We, uh, I, there's a podcast game that I'm doing right now where uh, my co-host and I are doing the same thing. We're going back and forth between DMing for different sessions and we have our mm -hmm. characters and they just have, fade a little bit into the background. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, uh, he hasn't said anything for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 well, that was the, the difficulty with the first one because we needed to have the whole group get together to have that, like, you know, the, they meet in a tavern sort of thing. So my character was there even though I was running the game. I'm like, he's not in combat, though. He's just there to make quippy remarks. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you're always tempted to abuse your power. You see, you see a very intriguing and handsome character enter. <laughs> He, he got oh, he got another game. natural 20. Oh, yeah, another oh. one. Oh, <laughs> he's, he's clearly so cool. he's the main character. Clearly, <laughs> I try not to do that as much as humanly possible. Um, but yeah, we're, we're here to, to talk about uh, you getting into the DM chair for Isle mm. Champions Presents The Black Pits. Yes, I'm delighted to do so. I've, I've really enjoyed all of the campaigns that we've run uh, for Idol Champions Presents. B. Dave, of course, is usually the DM. But now, speaking of that whole switching back and forth hey, between yeah. player and DM, B. Dave is going to be a player in the game. So I will be merciless. <laughs> no, 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 no. I will never I will never take the evil DM crown from B. Dave. But well, uh, well that's that's funny that you say that, though, because one of the things that I have been asking, because I've been doing these interviews with the, the players and whatnot, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I've been asking them is, what do you think is going to be a difference between Mark's DMing style and B. Dave's DMing style? Do, do you have any thoughts on what that might be? 
Mm, what your uh, style might be different of. Probably worse, just, you know, substantially <laughs> for in, in all respects. But uh, I'll do I'll my best. I'll that for a hot second. <laughs> uh, I certainly, uh, and I've had uh, the opportunity to switch off with B-Dave uh, for in-player DM seats uh, on the Black Dice Society, which yep. is, of course, the show we do on Thursdays on uh, the Dungeons & Dragons Twitch and YouTube channels. Uh, it's a Ravenloft campaign, and I'm a big Ravenloft fan, and uh, I was very gratified when B-Dave brought me on board. Uh, and it was last year. It was for my birthday, as a matter of fact. Uh, oh, that, that's right. Yes, I uh, I took over and I DM'd, and uh, you know my session. It just uh, we didn't get everything done, so I DM'd the following week as well. I just I stretched my birthday present out. Uh, a little <laughs> uh, and uh, B Dave uh, actually took over one of the NPCs uh, in the campaign, uh, Ermos the Half Giant, and I love, uh, <laughs> I love Ermos too. So it was great to have him as a player in those games. Uh, then. Of of course, there was also the Halloween special that we did. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, being a big Halloween fan, uh, I got to run that one as well. And, you know, there was a Headless Horseman and Festival of the Dead and the whole bit. So, yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. That's awesome. So 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 you, you, even though this is going to be I mean, Bayloth is going to be there, obviously, because black pits i mean well it, yes, it, yes it wouldn't be it without him um so do, do you even though like bailoff is kind of the the you know is aligned as evil uh you think you're gonna be a little less evil than than b dave when it comes to things well as a you know bailoff is certainly chaotic evil but you know the dm must remain true neutral I love that. Yeah, I love yes. that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, certainly uh, I will. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest. There are going to be some obstacles to overcome. Mm. And the Black Pits is one of the premier fighting leagues in the Forgotten Realms. So uh, it's, it's not going to be a cakewalk. That said, we have some very powerful uh, characters and some very canny players. So I think uh, it'll be a challenge for me just to keep up with them. <laughs> it's true. Um, well, what, why don't why don't you tell us a, a little bit about uh, Bayloth and your history with Bayloth? Now, Bayloth, I, I should mention right at the outset, I did not create Bayloth. Uh, Bayloth was actually created uh, by the folks at Beam Dog, and I believe it was Andrew Foley who did a lot of work on uh, on the stuff that involved him. Uh, I think Andrew was the one that sort of introduced the alliterative nature of uh, Bayloth's dialogue. I do my best when I'm playing to throw those in. It's a lot easier when you're working from a script to uh, to throw alliteration in, <laughs> but. His his entire mo and uh, the entire scenario of the Black Pits was created by them, and I was hired to play him uh, and to so give awesome. him a voice in the Baldur's Gate Enhanced Editions that Beam Dog did, uh, taking over from Bioware's uh, earlier work, of course, and expanding it out. Bayloth was in the Black Pits, which was essentially a mini game within the extended uh, or the enhanced edition uh, of Baldur's Gate One. And he also proved uh, popular enough that he he showed up again in Baldur's Gate 2. Also, within the first game, uh, I think it's fine to give spoilers for a game that's been out that long. But, I think it's uh, fair. <laughs> yes. So in the course of defeating the Black Pits, you would probably end up killing Bayloth. Uh, oh. Bayloth, however, being, uh, you know, rather uh, well prepared for a chaotic sort, uh, had taken some precautions in the event of his death. Uh, he, of course, had access to a djinn who could grant wishes. And one of the wishes he made was that he would be resurrected uh, in the event of his demise. Najim, however, had a little fun with that. Uh, and within the game, he actually goes from being a very powerful big bad guy to a uh, big bad evil guy to uh, being resurrected at the same level as, as the party is, essentially. So he considers that a real fall from grace. Uh, and it is, you know, substantial, <laughs> yeah. substantial level drop. Uh, so Bayloth essentially is forced to work his way back up the ladder. And I guess in our current continuity, uh, he's he's back up he's back on top baby or or perhaps <laughs> it's happened before his fall you know D, &D continuity is always a little bit timey-wimey yeah a little, of, a little wobbly in there you know, especially when you you know for charity games i've played you know yeah. like a 20th level version of bayloth and then for the next game it's like okay well it's it's capped at eighth level so now this is an eighth level version of bayloth so it's like where in his timeline does this fit necessarily <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe there was some a, loki multiverse stuff going on there <laughs> yeah or perhaps you know some sort of you know maybe he angered a chronomancer at some point so he's he's always jumping around in his own timeline who knows uh but that's <laughs> 
that's that was the origin story of Bela. And uh, he was a very fun character to play. Of course, uh, they, you know, they gave me uh, quite a bit of free reign in how I'd interpret him. Of course, you know, we tried out a few things, but I think we landed on his voice fairly quickly. I'm not going to lie. In the initial uh, interpretation of Bailoth, uh, Mark Hamill's Joker was a, a very big influence. Oh, in OK. Yeah. But also uh, not necessarily vocal wise, but just in terms of the character, I always compare him to uh, Arcade from the X-Men uh, or the X-Men villain arcade yeah. and, or Mojo, another X-Men villain. And, you know, they, they have similar, uh, similar MOs and motivations. Mm-hmm. Like they're all about the ratings. He's all about the spectacle. Uh, uh, arcade is all about the, you know, his ingenious death traps. Bailoff's all about, you know, the, the matches that he sets up. Uh, he's also, you could be likened to a sort uh, a Vince McMahon type. Uh, he does have a very high in fifth edition. This is fifth edition version is a very high performance skill, but that's, it's not like he's a singer or a performer per se. It's mm-hmm. all about his barking and, you know, carnival barking essentially. His presence. And, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Getting, getting the crowd riled up before the big match. Love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, uh, you're saying that you, you landed on the, the voice fairly quickly and, you know, uh, if, for people who don't know, yeah, you you do a lot of voice acting. You <laughs> and, I have and, yes, and uh, and so yeah, I, I I was wondering about coming up with a voice for a character for a game. How how do you go about doing that? Uh, usually, uh, especially with video games, you don't get a lot of prep time. It's not like a, a role in, say, a film or or certainly a play where you're going to have uh, you know a lot of rehearsal time. Uh, or or even sometimes a chance to really examine the script. A lot of time with video games, just for matters of confidentiality and logistics, you're often presented with your script when you show up the studio for your session. So you'll get a little bit of time, but it's essentially coaching on the spot. And what you're doing is jumping in with both feet right off the bat Mm -hmm. Uh, and being an improviser. Of course, I don't mind that sort of thing. So when you're crafting the voice, you'll know a little bit of background going in. You're not going to have had a lot of time to prepare. And so it's good to have that give and take with the director. So usually in in any given project, I'll try a few different takes. They'll, you know, just say, "Uh, how's about this? How's about this? And they might go, ah, that second one. Yeah. We'd like that second one. Let's explore that one a bit further. Uh, You might even go back to an original voice. So after a little bit of exploration, then you, you sort of have to make your decision fairly quickly in the process. Okay. And, uh, and again, that's, that's going to be uh, with input from the director. And sometimes you might have the writer uh, in the room or sometimes even the client, if it's uh, say a commercial thing. So Okay, so, and that's just stuff that I, I I didn't know, and I've always been curious about. <laughs> but uh, but going back going back to Black Pits, so you you're DMing this one. You've got Bail off there. You got the Black Pits, and you know you call it a fighting arena. But like, what what is what would you say is like the definition of the Black Pits? Like, if someone didn't know what it was, what would you, what's your like elevator pitch for it? Oh, it's the most gruesome gladiatorial combat the Underdark has to offer. <laughs> Astounding displays of martial and magical might. Uh, it's it's it is basically a fighting pit. Uh, in the past, uh, at least in the continuity of the games, uh, Baylot's mo was that he would just kidnap groups of adventurers and make them fight in the pits. That said, he did reward them with actual magical mm-hmm. items and gold and things like that. And if you were successful, you could win your way through. Okay. Okay. So, so you have this party of Idol Champions presents characters coming in, and you know, yes, he's not the- kidnapping them because they're <laughs> his, peer, his peers. They're his peers for starters, uh, and they're also his peers in terms of power. So, Bayloth, like a lot of evil people, would not necessarily uh, pick a fight with those that he knew would be capable of besting him. Uh, also, let's face it, he he's a bit of a fame hound. So, these are all well known. People, so he's he's attempting to get them on side, and I I I, I don't want to reveal the details. Well, yeah, of the I, I was gonna say, I was gonna say without spoilers, are, are there is there any kind of uh, info that you can kind of give people ahead of time of like why the the players might uh, be showing up in the black pits? 
Well, if you have watched any of the Idol Champions games, you'll know that Baylot's pretty relentless in his pitches, uh, whether it's promising fame or just a good time or excitement. Uh, There's and, a whole you Luke know, McKay comic about it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And there are, you know, there are other incentives. For example, uh, Whittle uh, has the Black Pits to thank for a very powerful artifact that uh, she currently possesses. So there are fabulous prizes to be won. Mm. I think most. Most of the characters that we're dealing with are at the point where they're, you know, they're not really going to be lured by gold or even magic. So uh, you have to appeal to hmm, perhaps their better nature. I, again, I don't want to give too much away. Okay. But if you watch the first episode, I think the premise will be established fairly quickly. I I, I, I do enjoy that because uh, I, I, I've asked the, some of the other players, like, what, what do you expect to happen in this? And one of the things that everyone keeps going back to, like, well, I hope I don't have to fight my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, because that, that, that could be interesting if it does mm. happen. If. Mm. <laughs> well, I hadn't considered that, but now <laughs> that has to be a real showcase part of the entire affair. Well, hmm, hmm, oh hmm. Lord. Now I'm going to get blamed for all that. If that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, okay. Bailoff knows there's limits to co coercion and persuasion. And uh, I don't, th and again, with, uh, with characters of this level, I don't think he'd even attempt an intimidation role. <laughs> What uh, what was it like uh, coming up with the game for this for Idol Champions Presents? Did you find that it was uh, any different than you know how how you would normally do for like a stream game? Or uh, obviously, stream games are, are getting ready for is a little bit different from a home game. Mm -hmm. But uh, what 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 was it like making this one for Idol Champions Presents? Uh, well, I worked with uh, the folks at Idol Champions, and you know something, they did all the work. I, I threw in. <laughs> They did all the hard work of typing stuff up and writing things down. And I, you know, I toss out ideas it's like, mm, how about this? How about this? How about this? Uh, and also I was there uh, mostly to provide background on the black pits and whatnot, mm -hmm. because of course, in addition to knowing the initial games and like the, the way the black pits was originally structured back in the day, uh, I've used Bayloth uh, a number of times in campaigns that I've done, uh, particularly for the ones I've done for D and D in a castle. Uh, oh. That, you know, that at least a, a portion of the campaign involves a little trip to the Black Pits and uh, and meeting Bailoth and that sort of thing. Uh, don't, and you, even... don't you have a staff that has the skull at the top, too? For oh, Bailoth? yes. Yeah, yeah. I've, I cosplayed Bailoth uh, oh, at fantastic. one time. I think it was for the Edmonton Expo back in... Hmm, I want to say 2015, 2016. And mm. uh, so, yeah, Beamdog uh, paid to have the actual Bayloth skull staff constructed. Uh, we brought in uh, Prue Olenek, who is a fantastic local makeup artist to, who's worked on a lot of the shows that I've done. Uh, she brought in like this fantastic lace front wig, you know, the, the really expensive wigs where it's like, oh, yeah, this wig, this wig is is going to cost as much as a small car. And, uh, <laughs> you know, had that, did you know, did the purple makeup and everything. I had the red contacts. And uh, yeah, that was that was fun to actually get to physically embody Bayloth like that. I do. I wouldn't do it so that often because it was, you know, a process of several hours uh, getting to Bayloth. You know, it's not it's not like Uriah on the Black Dice Society where I can just put a hat on. It's, it's closer to the Azalin Rex, but I was about to say, <laughs> yeah, even longer than that because Azalin Rex is a silicone mask. So okay, yes, yeah. Uh, so, well, actually, that, that, that I mean, the, not saying that this would would happen for for the show, not making any promises, but just mm -hmm. one of the things that you do is uh, cosplay and costumes and stuff like that. And I, the 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 Azalin Rex, the first time that showed up on screen, completely blew me away. I was not ready for that <laughs> at all because I'm glad to hear it. Because we we don't see it as often in stream games of like that level of cosplay. Because you know. I think a lot of people are worried about like comfort. When I, I remember back in the PAX games, uh, uh, Scott Kurtz would have the the helmet, the Binwin helmet on. He's like, "This is oh, too yeah, heavy. I'm taking this off." <laughs> <laughs> so, ha have like, you? Come on, Scott. I was a, been a complete prosthetic here. What's going on? I know, uh, right? <laughs> I won't but, begrudge Scott his desire to not wear a heavy hat. But, oh yeah. Uh, Oh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we. I guess we do at Black Day Society. We tend to uh, to do up the cosplay when we play. And uh, oh, yeah, I don't with know if Nora, and <laughs> Nora, she just did the. Uh, if you've seen, uh, it was just posted this week. Uh, and this wasn't even for the main show. This was mm -hmm. for a bonus Patreon uh, episode uh, where she did uh, the Nahara body taker plant with this full, yeah, uh, complete makeup wild. and the contacts. It, it was it's astounding. Uh, go check out her Instagram or her Twitter uh, if you want to see pics of that. 
have have you have you ever busted out the cosplay for a home game? Uh yes, yeah, I have. I mean, I actually uh have done like uh, zo- a lot of Zoom mm-hmm. games uh over this pandemic. Uh and I just happened to have because I've been doing something else and I had essentially you know, a beard and a helmet and a breastplate, you know, for a dwarf that was just happened to be sitting by my computer. And I was playing a home game and somebody, they brought in like a dwarf NPC and they said, you know, uh, Mark, why don't you play him? And so I was able to just like quickly, like put put it all together, uh, which, uh, which gave everyone else a real treat. That's fantastic. (laughs) You never know what Mark will look like when he shows up to a game. (laughs) Um, so like, like we said, the, you, you've played in idol champions before as bail. In fact, I think you've been in every single one of them. Haven't you? I think so. Yeah. 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 Uh, what, what, what have you loved about being, about being part of idol champions presents? Oh, just getting to play with everybody and as their characters from Idol Champions, which is a lot of fun. And as I mentioned, you know, Bailoth is a, a real uh, fame hound. So like getting to hang out with, uh, for example, you know, Minsk and Boo and, and uh, just getting rub elbows with everybody. Oh, I think he was he was very excited to meet Melf uh, when Luke Gagax played him. So that's right. It's like Melf of Melf's acid arrow. Really? <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah, no, I, I'll champions presents. I like. I remember when uh, I got champions of lore with uh, with B. Dave and Aaron, and uh, that's when I got to hear like the background whispers about this going on, and they were like, "Oh yeah, we got you know we got this person, this person." And Mark Mirror, I'm just like, "What?" <laughs> you get to see all these cool people play D and D together, and mm. every single one of them has been a blast. And I and I've genuinely loved. Uh, uh, Bailoff's uh, little things here and there about, yeah, trying to get people into the black pits and whatnot. <laughs> it's, yes, it's yeah, well, fantastic. as I say, I mean, this is the culmination of all that, you know, the fact he's yeah. finally actually managed to talk a bunch of his friends into coming uh, to the black pits to perform. It, it is paying off on a on a long running joke too, like that. That I love that sort of stuff where it's not just a payoff; it is a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, go, going to DMing again, what mm. what is it that you love about DMing? Well, DMing is, of course, uh, it's not. Some people think it's, uh, oh, you're just you're telling a story to the players, but it's not that. It's the players and the dungeon master cooperatively with the, you know, the dice essentially acting as improv suggestions uh, <laughs> regarding success or failure, collectively creating a story together. And, and that's something that's always appealed to me. I do a lot of improv. I do a lot of long form improv uh, narrative based stuff where, uh, for example, we might get a suggestion and then just improvise for an hour based on that suggestion, do an entire improvised play. And oh, wow. Yeah, and and seeing that at the table, especially sometimes it's even more gratifying when it's people who are not uh, performers by trade mm. uh, and creating a story together that has uh, weight and emotional resonance. Uh, that's that's really gratifying. One of the things uh, I, I used to have a D and D podcast where people would write in with questions, and one of them that I got so often was, "How do I get better at?" M- improvising as a dm and mm-hmm. obviously you know you you are improv artists like you you've done a bunch of shows and stuff like that so but like what do you what piece of advice would you have for someone whose time they get to improvise is only in the dm seat do you, ha- do you have any advice for them that they could get better at it with well uh, applying the rules of improv to that situation of course i'll always say you know there's a lot of improv theater out there and actually local theaters could really use a hand uh, right at this particular moment in history so enrolling for you know a, a session of improv workshops is always a good idea i would i would advise it but applying say you, you know there are there are online resources for improvisation and uh, and applying the basic rules of improv to your dungeon master style uh can yield some fantastic benefits uh acceptance saying yes not blocking uh not being welded to the story that you have planned it's okay of course you you're going to want to do a little bit of preparation my style tends to be largely improvisational Mm -hmm. but i understand that if people you want to have certain things happen uh but just understand that your players are making suggestions and uh, you should accept the suggestions. Like some, it's like, "Mm, maybe we will go on this little diversion. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will take this little side path and then find a way to loop back into this main (laughs) story that you have planned. And those little diversions can be just as entertaining and fulfilling as, as anything else. 
Yeah, and, and there, there's the one that I always fell back on when I when I would answer the question because you know I I'm I am not uh, anyone that I would call like uh, an, an improv expert. Like I watched Whose Line Is It Anyways a bunch as a kid. Like that, that, that was that was my intro to improv. That is and, a good base for an education in improv. Sure. <laughs> I man, I always wanted to just do some of those skits with with friends I, like that. I always wanted that. None of my other friends ever like were interested in improv or anything like that. I'm like I'll just be over here. I'll just think about it. <laughs> uh, but the one that I always came so where, back to. Where are you based, Trevor? Uh, I'm in San Diego. Okay. I'm sure there are some improv groups in San Diego. If you, you, know, if you sought never, out, if you sought out an improv looked. workshop, yes. Huh. I bet you can find a drop in. Hmm. Maybe I'll have hmm. to look into that. Maybe. Um, but the, the one that I always fell back on was the one that, you know, you hear so much was, is, is the yes and. Is to, is to take it and, and mm -hmm. you know you know do something with it um but you know that that's my thing from from this perspective it like is yes and like a good method that people can just try out or is, is there something a little extra to it that i'm missing with it well i mean the the basis of yes and is essentially you adding to something with not negating the other suggestions that come forth uh you advance the story, but you also, uh, you do take what's been offered by the other players. So mm -hmm. if somebody has uh, has introduced some concept or element into the game, you don't negate it. You don't go, no, oh, that's not the case. That doesn't, that's, that's not true. You go, oh, I guess that is true. And here's what that leads to. And here's what story possibilities that opens up. Uh, and I find that if you approach Dungeons and Dragons that way, it can just be a happier experience for all concerned absolutely yeah the 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 you know there's always the horror stories of uh well not not quite horror stories there's worse stories out there but like essentially of just you know a dm that just shuts down up player ideas and is like no you cannot do that no you can't do this and i like i've never heard someone say they have a dm like that and been like it was an enjoyable experience it's always the ones that like will go with what the players are are wanting mm -hmm. to do and whatnot um and like you were saying uh, you you leave a lot of your dming more to uh to the improv side of things things and I've found myself doing that more and more as I go on. I used to write these detailed uh, prep notes until I realized I'm outlining a book. Uh, this is not, <laughs> I'm not outlining a D&D session, I'm outlining a book. Um, and so the, the more I've done with it, the more I, I've gotten to the point where I have just kind of sparse notes for things I hope will happen. We'll see mm -hmm. if the players allow that to happen, <laughs> but, uh, and, and just kind of going with what they want to do from there. Um, so, when it when it comes to to DMing versus being a player, though, what do you find uh, it, it, the like? Is there any difference in the improv uh, things that you you use in that, or is it pretty similar between player and DM? Uh, well, the basics are always the same, uh, and actually, one of the other primary rules of improv, especially you know improv for on stage, is always make the other person look good. So, oh, I love that. I, I think applying that to both, you know, to intra-party relationship and also the relationship between the party and the DM, uh, always make the other person look good and then everyone will look good. Uh, and you're not necessarily going to be streaming your home game, of course, but just that principle still applies. I, I, I really do like, cause like yeah, when, when, when I am in the DMC, I, I, I've said that like I'm I'm a fan of my party like I like I I'm their I'm their one fan that's watching the stream and I want them to succeed and so I do want them to look cool but I, I like I hadn't thought about that as far as as a player goes of like trying to get everyone else to look just as cool and, and I'm not saying all that I ever tried to shoot shoot them down or anything I'm like no I'm the one that got the kill in fact usually it's the other way around um, <laughs> but uh, yeah funnily enough uh, Bayloth does not uh, subscribe to that uh, because <laughs> of course you have, you'll remember trials about Tiamat he just waited until Tiamat had essentially already surrendered and then power would kill right at the end and then <laughs> took all the credit but that is his you know that he is an evil character that is his what he's doing but as a player you mm -hmm. should make the other players look good. You can have characters who are completely despicable, but as a player, okay. you should always be supporting the other players. I love that. That that mm. is that I, I think that might be the best advice I've gotten in an interview. <laughs> and, and, and and by the same token, you know, people often do the thing of uh, well, my character wouldn't do that, so I'm just going to I'm just going to be an impediment uh, to the adventure and to everybody else having yep. getting to do anything. Uh, so. It's possible for your character to say no to something while you as a player say yes to it. Mm -hmm. 
you know, whether that's, you know, as something as simple as having your player grumble and gripe, but still, you know, like, you know, like, I don't want to do this, but still be packing their leather backpack and, you know, putting yeah. it on their back as they do it. Uh, or uh, whether it's, you know, in, in a broader sense, your character can have certain feelings about things, but you as a player should always be making sure that everybody is cooperating and everybody's having a good time at the table. Uh it's fantastic. And and of course, that applies even more so to the DM because the DM has a little more control over what kind of time everybody says. Well, one of the one of the things when uh, when you DM'd Black Dice Society, because yeah, for, for those viewing, I edit the podcast. For this, so I've heard all of them um, <laughs> as um, one of the things I was so impressed with was when you had Brother Uriah and his uncle. I can't remember his uncle. The, Oh, uh, Firan, Firan Zalhon. He's actually, he's from the lore. He's actually part of the uh, the official lore. It, but when you had the two of them talk, because there, there's always the joke with DMs where like they have two characters talk and it's just the DM talking to themselves. Mm -hmm. But when when you did it, it absolutely didn't feel like that. And, and obviously that does come from a part of like, you have given these characters their own voice and their own way of speaking. Um, but do, do you have any advice for, for DMs when they have to have the two NPCs talking to each other uh, for the party? Uh, you don't necessarily, because actually, when you think about it, uh, you, you brought up the example of Uriah and Ferenc Zalhonen. Mm -hmm. uh, I also, of course, play Aslan Rex uh, in yes. Black Dice Society. And that was actually one of the major draws when P. Dave said, oh, and I'd like you to play Aslan Rex, one of your favorite villains uh, of all time. Uh, so... Uh, if you haven't seen Black Dice Society, essentially Aslan Rex is one of the Dark Lords. Uh, he he in the current continuity, there's he's not quite the Dark Lord of Darkon. He seems to have somewhat abdicated. Uh, and in our particular campaign, uh, he has uh, a bit of a hold on Uriah. I won't give give too much away in case people want to start watching the stream. But uh, essentially, I've, I've had to play Uriah and Aslan in the same scene. And they have very distinct voices because Uriah is the, you know, sort of uh, British accented uh, Ichabod uh, Crane type. And Aslan is a lich, a powerful Dark Lord lich. Uh, Firan Zalhonen, on the other hand, actually, his voice is quite similar to Uriah, Uriah, because they have the same accent. They actually, again, I won't give too much away, but they look mm -hmm. the same. And uh, he's just a slightly older version. That said, he's a much more confident version. He's uh, not, uh, not jumping at his own shadow constantly. And so even though they have essentially the same voice and the same accent, I'm able to differentiate them just in terms of their status, uh, terms of their uh, their bearing, their carriage, their personality. Uh, so think about your NPCs. And, and again, even someone who's from the same region, two humans with the same accent from the same region, uh, one is a wealthy merchant and uh, one is, uh, say, a uh, the guy who sweeps up the 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 puke and the spilled beer at the end uh, they might have completely different takes and they might have they they might have the same sort of accent and voice but they're going to be completely different characters just in their approach and so that is actually a, a good test if if you can have a conversation between these two people and be able to tell who's t saying what yeah I, I I I know the times that I have done that. I I have sat there in my own head. I'm going, like, you're just talking to yourself, and it does not it doesn't sound different. <laughs> I mean, the good shortcut is to give everyone a very distinctive voice, but then then you start running out of all the voices you can do. It's, it's just like, ah, and you're just like oh, oh, this God. guy's German. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah. I can do. It. Yeah, yeah. No, there's plenty of times. I'm like, is he British, Australian, or New Zealand? Which one was this one? <laughs> um. Well, That's why I always uh, envy uh, 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 British DMs because they can do all the regional accents. Some of them can do all the regional accents of like, okay, this guy will be Somerset. Uh, this guy will be, yeah, so. Yep. Uh, one of the other questions I had for you, though, uh, connected to Bayloth is, you know, we, we've said his alignment is chaotic evil. Um, how, how do you recommend players going about playing an evil aligned character in a party? Because most of the, I know most of the time they think like, oh, it has to be an all evil campaign. You know, we can't, there can't be like good and then one evil person. Like, but you know, it, it has been handled by you uh, many times now. 
Uh, well, I was very conscious of that, knowing that most of the party is going, to, you know, especially in Idol Champions, most most of them are good. And, mm-hmm. you know, like you have a few neutrals in there. Evil characters are a lot rarer and you want things to go smoothly, especially because th- this is not like a home table game where, oh, it'd be really fun to examine the, you know, the rivalries within the party. Uh, you know, we only have so much time and we have an adventure to do. Uh, so. And in the in the interests of uh, going along to get along, uh, Bayloth, Bayloth has certainly kept things toned down. And from my perspective, again, it's it's him interacting with characters that he knows are as powerful as he are, as powerful as he is. So he's like, eh, I think I'll I'll just uh, not necessarily have them all turn on me and destroy me because I know they're capable of doing that. So. He's certainly much more restrained than when I've used him as an antagonist in mm-hmm. in games, uh, as you know, as the big bad evil guy. Uh, he also he's got motivations, right? He wants all of these people. Uh, that that was one of the the reasons why I brought that that thing of him always trying to get people to come to the black pits is that he wants something from them. He is he is evil, and so by definition, selfish. Uh, mm-hmm. So. It's something that he wants, and he's going to be on his best behavior around them. Essentially, it, the you, you said the right there the 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 selfish thing. Like I, I love B Day's interpretation of like the good and the evil thing of like good is yes, uh, selfless yeah. and evil is selfish. And, and yeah, yeah, I, we've B Dave and I have talked about this, and I, I totally agree uh, with him on that point. And uh, the other thing is, of course, that uh, Bayloth, he's he has a sense of self-preservation as well. We talked about how he's, he's probably not going to throw his weight around and threaten people uh, when he realizes that, Oh, yeah, mints could easily take my head off. So maybe I won't do that. <laughs> Took that dragon's head off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I, I, I hadn't, I, I think there's a perception when there's the, the, the evil character in the group that I, I think everyone has the opposite viewer they're like oh the the evil guy is gonna try and kill all of us but you made a great point there the the evil guy's not stupid like (laughs) he sees that he is outnumbered (laughs) beyond that it's like what do i have to gain from doing this you know so yeah that that is fair that is fair that that does that does make me because i i haven't had uh an evil character in like a group uh before and now that does make me kind of that kind of tempts me to, to try that out at some point and see how that would go uh thinking yeah. of it more in the the selfish sort of way instead of the, like i'm just gonna stab you <laughs> yes exactly you know like not not all evil characters are the joker right <laughs> so some of them have different motivations some like of them think they are <laughs> <laughs> Some of them think they are, sure. But, uh, and, and again, like uh, the motivations of a chaotic evil character are completely different from the motivations of a lawful evil character. And in fact, those characters might find themselves in opposition uh, with each other. That was uh, always fun. Just, uh, well, hey, l- let's not mention the blood war. So <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely fair. <laughs> um, so. One of one of the things that uh, the other things I wanted to bring up was uh, you you've been in D and D in a castle, and I have. I've just I just got to ask how is it running D and D in a freaking castle? <laughs> it's pretty great. It's pretty great <laughs> for me. It's awesome. It's uh, I I assume the players are enjoying themselves too. Uh, there is. <laughs> It's, it, you know, it's, it's such an immersive atmosphere and surrounding and also uh, just because it's such a concentrated role play experience, uh, you get, to, you know, uh, a typical campaign is a 24 hour campaign over the course of three days. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. And uh, I would tend to do afternoon and evening sessions at uh, D&D in the castle, which meant that people who are in my campaign would have the mornings free to do one shots or uh, sometimes even not even necessarily RPGs. I think some people were playing like card games and things like that. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's also uh, opportunities for like miniature painting workshops and falconry and archery and all kinds of things. So (laughs) Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of the miniature painting Uh, as a DM. You're actually a lot of your free time is like okay i gotta prepare the next thing uh okay well this is completely changed so i I, you know i can't do that or again in my case uh a lot of the times my player group would introduce something and it's like yeah i think i want to create something just to follow up on that character's Mm -hmm. background or thread or or what you know the npc that they randomly ran into it's like i'm gonna flesh that out and uh it's it's a really fun fun time exhausting sometimes for the dms i bet 20 24 hours over three days i 
I'm tired just thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> but did, did you did you have to prep at all any different? Because you said that you did mostly you mo normally you do mostly improv with it. Did you prep more than normal for these? Uh, I well, I did basically what I always do is like I know what the opposition is. I know what the the basic, uh, you know, the plot points are for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. But I do leave it open to my players if they want to completely go off in a different direction. It's like okay, that's great. I just have to call up some stats and you know, I I also. I guess I did more planning for D&D in a castle because I wanted to do it with all the bells and whistles. So I, mm. I tried to have miniatures for everything, for example, oh, you know, like was, I've got a fairly extensive miniature collection. So I just wanted to make sure I had everything. And if I didn't have something, it's like, mm, I'll buy, I'll buy a miniature for that and paint it or have it painted and, and just make sure that it's ready to go just in case. That must've been quite the carry on bag. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking actually for my fall sessions, I might have to bring two suitcases because oh my God. Uh, uh, it's a, we're also doing a big Halloween party uh, at the end of it, at the end of the October sessions. Oh, that's so cool. So I'll need, you know, to bring a costume and then a, a separate costume for the Barovian ball. And you know, so there, there's going to be there's going to be quite a bit of luggage fees, I think, involved. Barovian ball is the coolest sounding event ever. And I, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> uh, but you, you were saying before the show that uh, you're, you're actually doing more D&D in the castle this year. I am. Yes. Uh, so I was booked to do uh, all the October sessions uh, and, you know, culminating with the Halloween party in the castle at the end. And uh, I was planning a very Halloween-y adventure, which I'm currently still working on and assembling miniatures for. Mm. But uh, then uh, they they contacted me and uh, asked me to do a September slot as well. All my October spots had sold out. So I do, I think, as of recording. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I do as have... of June 14th, I know that's breaking the fourth wall. As of June sure. 14th, there are mm -hmm. slots. <laughs> yes, I've got spots for, I believe, round five, which is September 14th to 18th. So okay. I'll, I will be there for that as well. Well, if, if you if you ever want to mark freaking mirror to DM you for a game, check that out. And uh, and who knows, maybe maybe he will. Um, so, uh, you know, we talked about uh, Isle Champions Presents a little bit about uh, um, uh, Black Dice Society. Are there any other uh, recorded games that you do regularly? Uh, I do do a vampire podcast called Stitch of Fate, a podcast by night. Ooh. And uh, we have just finished up our second season of that. And uh, Pod by Night, uh, actually, I believe... I think it was today they actually launched uh, a hunter's game as well. Uh, I'm oh, not really? in that one. I'm in the vampire one, but I play a Nosferatu named Max, uh, who's been a lot of fun to play. And uh, we again, we started at the at the height of the pandemic uh, doing this. It is an, an audio only podcast. We have done a few uh, live ones like in full cosplay me with in in my Nosferatu bat prosthetics and the whole bit. Oh, uh, my God. <laughs> And yes, and I believe uh, uh, Pod by Night has its own channel now. And uh, yeah, so uh, you, uh, I, I think they are their hunter show. They're actually streaming it live. Uh, normally, like up till now, they've been we've been doing pre-recorded, but that's a lot of fun. So uh, that's Stitch of Fate, a podcast by night, and it can be found wherever you find a podcast. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, actually, the, here, here's an interesting one. It might be a weird question, but like, do you find that there's any difference between playing in a stream game and playing in an audio only like recorded, it's going to be listened to later game? Uh, I'm not sure because I mean, from my perspective, it's the same. I think mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in a Zoom meeting. I see everyone while we're recording it. And uh, I think we just also have to have another window open that's doing all our recording. So, okay, yeah. I, from, I, my, I, from my perspective, it's very similar. That's fair. And, and, and like I know, like we 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 turned Black Dice Side into a podcast, but like I, I I didn't know I didn't know if there was any sort of differencing as far as like the the recording process or anything like that for when it comes to exclusively for for audio for for y'all. Um, but yeah, good, good to know. I'm, I'm sure there are differences, but it's people who actually know what they're doing that have to worry about those. I mean, I just, I just join a Zoom meeting. That's all I do. Make sure my mic is on. That is fair. Yeah. That, uh, as the, the audio person, I, I, I very much appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Mark, thank you so much for, for sitting down with me today and, and talking about all this stuff. It has been an absolute blast. Um, if, uh, it, well, actually, what uh, awesome things are you working on where people can find you? 
Uh, you can, of course, uh, see me every Thursday on the official Dungeons and Dragons Twitch and YouTube channels in the Black Dice Society, mm-hmm. uh, DM'd by Mr. B. Dave Walters. Uh, you can also, as I mentioned, uh, hear me in Such a Fate, a podcast by night. Uh, that is found wherever podcasts are found. Oh, and also I'm in a new podcast called Veronica, which is a scripted uh uh, fantasy horror uh, audio drama it called wow. Veronica uh, and that is also the subject matter is vampires and zombies and werewolves oh my and all, Ooh, all sorts of things or, go, no no werewolves ghosts <laughs> <laughs> take the werewolves out put the ghosts in <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm mixing up my horror uh, podcasts uh, <laughs> that's fair <laughs> oh, and and of course I am available on cameo for all your mass effect catchphrase related needs <laughs> Oh, see, I, I, I should, I should, after the show, I should, I should go on there and get you to uh, be like, this is the best idle insights on the Citadel and put that before the show. <laughs> I can, I can do it now for free. I, I I'm mean, Commander Shepard. Okay, hold up. <clears throat> I'm Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite idle insights on the Citadel. Well, folks, uh, I'm going to go be happy for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That was way too kind of Here, you. let me, let me give you one as well. <clears throat> oh, no. I'm Commander Shepard, and Trevor is my favorite human on the Citadel. Well, that's going to be my uh, ringtone for eternity. <laughs> that's okay. That's cool. You can just PayPal me. Just PayPal me for that. That's cool. Sounds good. Sounds good. No, I'll joke. That's, that's on the house. That's on the house. I appreciate you. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, and, what, what socials can they find you on? Oh, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mark underscore Mir. You can find me on Instagram at MR period Mark Mir. That's Mr. Mark Mir. I do not have unified handles because I am disorganized. <laughs> No, and, there's, uh, there's always those people that go and grab them and it's just like why do you have that why why, do you have why, that? why you have that that's not your name that's my <laughs> name uh and uh of course i'm going to be at uh, gen con this year i think both black dice society and stitch of fate are going to be doing uh some panel slash shows there and i might be guesting on some other ones uh, i'm not sure if those have been announced yet but i will be around uh and i'll be at dragon con this year one of my favorite conventions in the known multiverse uh <laughs> returning there and uh it'll be great to see everybody again so uh i think i think that's most of it i, I sure. gotta say Mark, you're, you're you're getting close to the point you gotta use b days i i'm too busy don't try to keep up thing <laughs> 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 well again thank you so much for being on here and talking uh with us this is uh, fantastic and i cannot wait to see you run everyone through isle champions presents the black pits that is going to be an absolute blast and hopefully everyone survives <laughs> we'll see how it goes i am looking forward to it yes yes Uh, But that's going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for watching. Until next week, take care of yourself.